talk very quickly about uh, what teachers want and what I think education needs. Uh, I, I, as the last speaker, and I know we're all over time, I'll tell you this, I'm going to take 13 minutes of your time to try to do this, okay? We can answer some of the questions later in some other sessions as we go. Uh, as we start to think about what has happened in education, a lot of things are available today that didn't used to be available. Not only can you do pretty rich simulated environments like this fantastic calculator that you can uh, put right in with some of your coursework, but you can do things like this cognitive synapse test that was shown to me by a professor at Rutgers. Now what happens here is it actually measures the speed at which your eyes, your hands, and your brain are connected. It can tell you how fast the synapses are firing. And she said that when she put this into her class, that the unit that this surrounded when her students were taking this particular test, that not only did they turn it into a game, they actually had 70 screen captures to prove that someone had gotten the best score and by the end of the semester they crowned the winner. But she said that at the end of the class, they had the best conversation that she has ever had on any subject around the information that, that uh, this was a part of. When we start to think about what's possible in education, a lot has changed. And I want to see if I can show you some of that. If you were to ask me who I am, this would be my world. These are the words that go into making up the person that you see in front of you. But it's not until you start to take some of these things, like the fact that I'm a teacher for Shamadan University, I'm a professor there, uh, that I am the chief academic at uh, Pearson, that I'm also a father, that I'm also a, a husband, those sorts of things. It's not until you start to put this stuff into some semblance of order that you have a sense of who this person is right up in front of you today. Well, what I want to do is I want to try to start to give you some impression about these concepts. Because learning is huge. Learning is gigantic. And there's so much to it. And I want to see if I can help you with that with, with three fairly simple points. I'm going to talk about uh, learning frameworks. I want to talk about data. And I want to talk about personalization. Now, the key to all of this from my standpoint is, in order for us to really change education, it has to involve learning environments. Now, I don't care what kind of learning environment you use, whether it's uh, one with a vendor and, and you're actually working uh, together with, with the services and elements that go there, whether you're utilizing open source, and, and while that's certainly not free, it's definitely open and available for certain things, or if you're using a truly free option like uh, Open Class that was just released last month, whatever it might be, these are the elements and aspects that are going to give you the ability to provide data, to get personalization, and to actually make it happen. Let me see if I can show you what I'm talking about. Now, I'm not saying this just because uh, technologically advanced internet learning really is available anytime. That's fantastic. That's a, a great perk that you can get access anytime, anywhere. That's fantastic. It's not just because the engagement level has shifted and changed with what we can do in an online environment like these simulated, uh, this chem chemistry element or whatever it might be. What I, what I first want to talk about are those learning frameworks. Whatever you use, whether it's Gardner's Intelligences or uh, Bloom's Taxonomy or Myers-Briggs, whatever it is that you think of when you think of teaching and learning, I think you can boil it down to five points. Tell, show, do, review, and ask. So first of all, in a digitally enabled environment, you can tell. Now, we've been telling for a long time. In fact, what's exciting to me about my job is that I, I'm at a place where online learning has grown up. You know, it's 18 years old now, and it's an adult, so we can kind of let it go and do its own thing. But as you think about online learning, it's, better, it's past just text and graphics. Text under glass is what we usually call it. We're, we're well beyond that, but we can tell. We've always been able to tell. But then we can take it to the next level and we can show. We can actually show our students using these great free tools like Zentation.com that allows you to marry a YouTube and a PowerPoint and put those things together and suck them into your course and really show our students, model for our students those good behaviors. After you tell and you show, then we, we of course want our students to do. We know that students learn better when they accomplish something. And we can bring in things like these games, fantastic games like Discover Babylon. If you're just joining us now, a high magnitude earthquake has just struck. Thank you so much. Discover Babylon is a game that was built by the Federation of American Scientists in, con in conjunction with Sony PlayStation. It's free. Anybody can download it. But what's amazing is the, the results that they're getting from it. First of all, students that are in this environment are learning chemistry, they're learning sociology, they're learning history, they're learning all sorts of different things. It's called curriculum integration. They're learning it in two and a half weeks. And it would normally take a student sitting in a classroom every single day of the year for the entire year to get the same amount of learning. But here's what's even better from my perspective. The retention rates are five and six times greater than the students who are sitting in those classrooms. They're remembering this information months and years later, even though they played it for a shorter period of time than the students sitting in the traditional classroom. So we've got to tell, we've got to show, we've got to do. 
that can then lead us to review. Our students have to know what they know without it impacting their grade, without it impacting uh, their scores, but this gives us an opportunity to, again, engage with these fantastic multimedia elements and, and these great immersive interactive environments so that they can begin to get what they get. And then finally, we can ask. But asking is so much bigger and so much better than we've done traditionally using pen and paper. We can use confidence-based learning now in, in digital environments that really shows, did the student not just get the answer right? Did they know they were going to get the answer right? Because a student who says, I got it right and I knew I would, that's fantastic. They mastered it. They can move on. It's time for you to, to push them and, and accelerate them on. But the student who says, I know I got this right when in fact they got it wrong, that's a problem. There's some relearning that needs to take place, almost some unlearning, if you will, that has to happen, and then the relearning needs to take place. So tell, show, do, review, and ask are fundamentally different when we start to engage our students through technological means. Now, if, if none of that proves it to you, let me, let me try to prove it to you with this. If you're using traditional testing methods to, to get at this sort of thing, did you know that you can help your students remember something forever? I'll say that again. You can help your students remember something forever. Every one of us has something called a forget curve. When you learn something the first time, you will forget it in a certain period of time. And for everyone sitting in this room, it's different. For you, it might be you remember it on, you learn it on day one, you need to learn it again on day three, you need to learn it again on day six, and again on day, it's going to be that for you. For me, however, it may be day one, day two, day five, day seven. Everyone in this room is different. When I'm teaching my class of 20, 25, 30, 400 students, whatever kind of classroom setup you've got, there's no possible way for me to scale myself to know everybody's forget curve. But you know what can? The internet. There's a program out there called Head Magnet. Headmagnet.com allows you to create a flashcard that will literally pop up the information when you get on your computer at the right time. Because the idea is you need to be reminded just before you forget. And that's exactly what Head Magnet will do. It will remind you just before you've forgotten so that you remember it. It happens five times and it's yours for life. You will remember, remember it forever. That's the power of technology. Now, all of this allows our students to not just be problem solvers like this, but to be problem finders. All right, people who can actually go in and find a problem. This is just a little bit of a joke. I'm not talking about finding X like that. I'm talking about something like Innocentive. Innocentive allow, if you've not seen Innocentive.com, what they do is they say, hey, people who are not in the industry, will you help us fix something? We know that people within the industry have baggage, and they've got, they've got blinders on, and they can't see outside the box always. So, will you help us solve this problem? We'll pay you five grand, we'll pay you $10,000, we'll pay you $20,000 to help us solve these problems. You know, we can do the same thing with our students. We can say to them, here are three questions, please answer them. And what will they say? Well, wait a minute, how do you want me to answer that? I, I don't care, just answer the question. Well, do you want a word, you want a paper, right? A word document, a paper, I'll write your paper. What, what, how many sources in the paper? I don't care, answer the question. No, 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 you, you want a PowerPoint. I'll make a PowerPoint. That, that must be what you want. Can you show me a PowerPoint that someone else has done so I can kind of copy that? That's what our students are saying. We, say, we have to say, no, 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 be innovative, be creative. Show me what you can because in a technological world, I can see it all. I can see the start, I can see the middle, I can see the end of the process, I can see all of these things. All of that is data. And that data that gets produced actually allows me to take action for things. Did you know that as, as a cloud solution, that's what we're a cloud provider up here, so we've got millions of enrollments in these online courses. We have done studies, and I can tell you in the first 10 days of class if a student's going to drop that class or not. Because every single time we take this measurement, over hundreds of thousands of measurements, we found that the average completed student spends in the first 10 days twice as much time as the average drop student. And when you look at that kind of data, you can do something with it. We can start to see which programs are struggling, which disciplines are failing, which courses, which sections are having trouble. We can start to look at it from an outcomes perspective to say, how is a student doing with an outcome? How is a teacher teaching an outcome? How is this particular course at reaching an outcome? Where are the holes at the institution? Because these reports allow you to see for the entire group rather than it just being one teacher, one student trying to figure all this out themselves. There's transparency to this, we can see all of it as we go. And we can begin to visualize this stuff even more and even better. These are visual graphs that you might see around the social graph, like Facebook uses. 
Basically what this tells me here is the, the order in which my students go from piece of content to piece of content inside of my environment. I can see the page they land on, I can see the page they go to next, I can see the page they go to next. That helps me as a teacher as I design my courses. I can see the same thing with socialness. I can see who is interacting with whom. I can actually see if they're getting good grades or bad grades based on how much connection they have to each other. That's powerful. That's amazing. That's something that I cannot do as a simple 1 to 20, 1 to 30 teacher in a classroom. I don't necessarily know this, but now I've got data and I can visualize it appropriately. They, we can even see stuff like this collaboration graph that can tell you in one class there's a lot of collaboration that's taking place. And I can see the scores that my students get as a result. In another class where there's hardly any collaboration, I can see, first of all, how much more work the teacher has to put in. And number two, I can start to see, wow, the students are not doing nearly as well in that environment as they are when they communicate together. I can begin to do this. Now, at the same time, we can take stuff like this and begin to personalize the experience for our students. I have a friend named uh, Nicholas Krasakis. Some of you may have seen him give a talk on TED. And he, he found out that in neural networks, anytime there's a network of people, that they actually cluster together. There's certain clusters that start to form. He started this with obesity. He found that people who were obese tended to cluster with other people who were obese. Now, he looked at this statistically. He, he, he really researched this and found that it was absolutely true. If you were, were a friend of someone who's, who's obese, there was a 45% greater chance you also were obese. However, if you knew someone who knew someone who was obese, the chance of you being obese was 25% greater. So it actually was a clustering effect. And he took it from there and he blew it out into some other areas like happiness and sadness. People who are happy clustered together, people who are sad clustered together. But what was interesting was he took a sad person, put them in the midst of a happy group, and they became happy. He took a happy person, put them in the midst of a sad group, and he made them sad. Not, I wouldn't want to be that part of the experience, but that's, that, that's what he did. Couldn't we do that based on the social interaction graphs that we now have from the data that we're getting out of these systems with our students? Couldn't we cluster them so that a student who is failing, we put them inside of a cluster of A students or B students, you know what the, the, the logic would su suggest? They're going to become an A or a B student. They're going to succeed. Without data, that's not possible we can begin to personalize the experience. It kind of works like Amazon. Amazon works like this. You've got these individual pieces of information that are kind of floating around out there, what you buy, when you buy it, uh, what you look at, the surveys that you take, and then all of that is put into these clusters, and they, they put them into these groupings so that they know how much you purchased or based on the amount that you spent, you're clustered with a group or something like that. And then eventually what they do is they predict something for you. They suggest what you should do. Now, prediction ends up looking like this. You've probably seen this. You might also like. This works 37% of the time for Amazon. That's astounding. It works 100% of the time if you're my mom. <laughs> she loves this. She always says, I didn't know I needed that. And then she buys it. This is something we can do for our students. We can take the individual pieces of information that are floating around out there, how much time they spent on something, the outcomes that they get, the grades that they got, their completion rate, their retention rate, whatever that might be. And what we can do is we can cross-segment that and put them into groups and clusters and say, does one teacher get at an outcome better? Does one learning asset get to a grade better? Does one assessment assess our students in a better way, a course in a better way? We can begin to dissect this and figure out how to fix education. So that ultimately, what we're going to get to is a place where one student going through a course, no matter how difficult the elements of that course are, no matter how complex the elements of that course are, if it's a big collaborative project or if it's a simple rote memorization test or whatever that might be, we can see that we have complete transparency in that experience and then we can see how long it's taking them to go along the track. And by doing that, not just for one student, but for all students, we can begin to map and say, you know what? You're about to go down a path and you're going to fail. How do I know that? Because 1,800, 18,000 other students have gone down the same path and they have also failed. I'm going to interject. I'm going to put something in your way so that you've got a little bit of remediation or a little bit of acceleration or a, a little bit of whatever you need to succeed at the time. And we can get our students to a place where they're having an individualized experience because of that data that's coming out, regardless of the learning framework, in such a way that they can be successful. Technology can change education. Later, we're going to talk about it in some of our Q&A and some of that sort of stuff. But if nothing else, you've got to leave here today knowing technology is a powerful enabler. It really does allow us to do things that we never even dreamed that we could do 5, 10, 15 years ago. 
And I think you're going to see some of this during this conference. Thank you very much.